the creation of all human development efforts across all countries, all continents, can never be overemphasized. Leadership remains the fuel in the vehicle of sustainable growth and prosperity. It keeps the, that vehicle energized at all times. It's another beautiful Thursday here in the beautiful studios of Metro TV, and it's time for Leadership 360 Conversation. It's my usual and singular honor to welcome you to the show. Wherever you are watching us from, this is the continuation of our leadership discourse that will enable us to continue to learn, unlearn, and relearn, so as to accelerate the development of our leadership skills for the betterment of our communities, countries, and the continent at large. I am Dr. Victor Abe, your usual host. Stick around, let's take a quick message from our sponsors and we shall be right back. on my honor to be a better leader every day faithful and loyal to my country organization and fellow team members countrymen and women I pledge myself to remain true to the core values of integrity and self-discipline through my daily choices and actions my mind is alert focused at all times I shall show respect to everyone always and every time I remain a better leader and team player always. So I pledge. And so I pledge too, because we are all in the business of making our communities better. Welcome back. We are live on DSTV channel 277 and live on Facebook at Metro TV Ghana, and also live on VOL Online Radio. This is Leadership 360. Ketsi, our sponsors, Goel PLC, V5 Solutions Limited, and FV Global Consults. We are excited to bring you this program every week, and your support and participation has been amazing to us. Indeed, we are in the decade of Leadership it is described as leadership and more so youthful leadership for transformational and transformative engagement and, you know, pushing the frontiers for the betterment of our communities. If the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDG Goals, and the Agenda 2060 of the African Union is anything to go by, it is to succeed, it is belief that the youth has a critical role to play in that, you know, journey towards the dreamland. The focal topic for discussion today is about youth leadership and sustainable development. It's our belief that by the time we are done, we are all going to have different understandings from different perspectives of how we can all contribute meaningfully to the development of our community. We have a special guest today on the program. He's a passionate person who is so much obsessed with youth development in Africa. He has done this for several years. He is somebody who is well-schooled. He has a Master of Arts degree in Communication Studies and Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Sociology from all from the University of Ghana. And he has been in the business of youth leadership, a fellow of the Young African Leaders Initiative and Regional Leadership Center, West Africa. 
the president of African Chamber for Youth Development and the managing director of Kofidia Clinic in Ghana. Cherish viewers and audience, it's my honor to welcome our guest for today, Mr. John Apia. John. Doc. It's a pleasure having you on Leadership I'm so excited system. being here. I've been watching on YouTube and all that, following you closely. Today, I happen to be in the hot seat. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. We are excited to, so that you bring your experience and knowledge to bear right. on the general movement towards the betterment of our community, sure. our country sure. at large. Thank you, sir. Um, I hope you are doing well. Um, one day at a time. Because mm -hmm. the way things are going, if you attempt to take everything at once, you may not live to see the future. So I try to take it. That's right. So let some, I'm going to read out some you know statistics concerning the youth in Ghana and Africa all right so Ghana's population can best be described as rapidly urbanizing mm. and a lot of uh, these people who inhabit the urban centers are youthful and over the past uh, census it's believed that the population of Ghana is predominantly about 38 percent young people, aged between 15 to 35 years. That's a large chunk of yes. the population. You're right. And the just about 40%, 4%, just 4% are older population. That's 65 plus. Wow. That means that between 15 to 60, a lot happens in there. That's right. And more so, 15 to 35 are yes. highly energetic and useful to do a whole lot of things. Now, when we bring it to Africa, we have over 70% of the population on the continent under the age of 30. 70% of African population are youthful under age 30. Yeah. That means that this burgeoning youth population has a lot to offer to make a difference in our drive towards the betterment of our communities. They play a significant, or they will contribute significantly towards the, the, the leadership drive that we are all craving for. True. So if that is the case, there is also the case that by age, by the year 2050, the African population is going to rise almost double, currently at 1.4, it's likely to double by 2.5 billion. So we're going to have a population of about 2.5 billion yeah. on the African continent. And out of that, if you are told that 70% is youthful, what it means to me and any other person is that we have a lot to you know, tackle when it comes That's to right. you know, our development drive. That's right. Now, Within this population, you know, uh, statistics, lie opportunities and actions that we need to take. What do you make of these uh, revelations? Honestly, it's very inspiring, but also very scary, you know, to think of the fact that about 70% of the population in Africa are young people. You know, constantly there's a saying that the future belongs to the young people. But the key question for me is that are we preparing them for the future? And it's scary because... If we don't prepare our young people well, if we don't give our young people the opportunity to lead now, then we are in trouble in the future. And the point is that we have to be prepared in order to face the future. So when I hear statistics like that, I get very scared. In as much as I am into this field, trying to develop as many young people as possible, it, it, it tells me that we are not paying too much attention to youth development. We just say it and it's like a part of a statistic and then that stops there. But there has to be a concerted effort to ensure that we are preparing our young people for the future. them the opportunity now. We cannot afford to gamble with the future. We can gamble with today, but not the future. So when we give young people the opportunity today, after they've been developed and groomed and prepared, 
then the elder generation or the older generation are comfortable and confident that yes, our future is indeed bright. But if we don't put these two things together, the preparation and the platform and the opportunity, the future is not bright. Uh, well said. But John, many also argue that the young people themselves do not seem to be ready to be prepared to take up the mantle of leadership. What do you say hmm. to that? That's, that's an interesting perspective to come from. And having worked with young people, it appears that there's that you know, uh, impression, especially amongst young people, that I think that, no, okay, the problem is that I think that most young people are despondent. At this point, they are very shattered in terms of uh, the, the, their future ambitions and their plans because the system apparently is difficult, it's hard. So most young people have given up, honestly speaking. Because can you imagine somebody to have graduated from school over the past five years, the person has never gotten the opportunity to work. So at that stage, there's a lot of despondency, discouragement, disillusionment, and that is killing the drive for young people. And you know, young people, we thrive on, on, on the drive to do something with ourselves. But if you keep knocking and hitting and nothing happens, you give up on yourself. That is why it appears that most young people are not ready. And let me give you a typical example. We keep saying that sometimes our young people are not ready, but sometimes it's because we're not ready to give them the opportunity. And for those that are even given the opportunity, it is sort of extremely micromanaged to the point that the person fails. And when that happens, it becomes a precedent. And everybody assumes that when young people take the, the floor, they take the opportunity, they flop. All right? So I agree with you to a certain large extent. I think that is because of the disillusionment in the system. A lot of young people have dreams, they have ambitions. But if you are not able to put yourself together and gather enough confidence in yourself, you may give up on yourself. At the point where you're giving up, that is where it appears that we are not prepared because people are not ready to do anything else because they've done almost everything and it appears that nothing is working. Okay, so yes, you have taken the, the angle where you feel that opportunities are not given to young people. Yeah. Even when they are given those opportunities, they are micromanaged exactly. and all that. Exactly. So are you by that saying that capacity to lead exists within these young people? Yes, I'm very convinced that that capacity to lead. How? In which okay. way? So, um, right after graduation from school, let's bring it up to the tertiary level, all right? Young people have the mindset that we are, we are going to lead, we are going into the future, we are the people that's going to drive the future of the organizations and the businesses that we see around and all the organizations we have around. So, innately, or something deep inside of a young, every young person is that drive to lead, that drive not only to be at the forefront, but wherever the person finds himself or herself, the person is willing to contribute to the progress and development of, of that society or that setting. But unfortunately, right after graduation from school, that is where, in my opinion, the despondency sets in and kills the drive for leadership. So just, just not to cut you short, yes, sir. don't you think that to some extent they, they do not intentionally learn about the realities on the ground when it comes to leadership, yes. occupying leadership roles? Yes. Many argue that within the educational system, um, these young people are not really taken through the rudiments of leadership. Exactly. So they are subject, they have subject based knowledge. Yes. But not in leadership. Yes. What about that? You see, and that is a point where the older generation have a big role to play. Because it is like the, the, the syllabus or whatever it's used to teach, it is set before we even get into the university. All right. So I think that it, there should be a deliberate attempt by the older generation or those that have gone ahead of us to deliberately incorporate practical leadership training into the educational system. And we need to psych the minds of the young people at school that it's not just about your degree or your certificate. There's a leadership mindset you need in order to excel at everything that you do. But unfortunately, I've been through the system. I didn't have that kind of understanding when I was in the university, mm -hmm. for example. I was just thinking about graduating, doing my national service, mm -hmm. and getting a job. All right. But if there's a conscious effort to inculcate leadership into young people, responsibility into young people, it will make a great difference. And there's a point where I think that academia and industry will have to work together to let this thing happen. Because honestly, if uh, industry doesn't help in raising the right crop of people to work, then they are disadvantaged because the vacancies will exist, but they will, they will not be qualified enough people to fill those vacancies. So I think that it is high time the corporate organizations, the businesses, even the political systems, the governmental institutions, make it a point that beyond just giving the young people education, 
there's a conscious effort to inculcate into them a sense of leadership, a sense of responsibility, and a sense of patriotism. Because honestly, a lot of people have given up on Ghana. And I'm sure you know when you interact with a lot of young people, they are aspiring to leave the shores of Ghana. But if there's that conscious effort to inculcate leadership, responsibility, and patriotism into the young people, then the future of Ghana can be secured. All right. We will definitely come back to that. But sure. in your submissions, you made mention of the fact that you went through the system, yes. education, educational yes. system, yes. which we will revisit. Sure. Uh, there's some controversy about mm. our educational system as right. well on the continent. Right. And you mentioned you left school and expecting you know, what you have narrated to That's occupy right. or to get a job, occupy yeah. certain roles and yeah. all that. But at a point, you came to a certain realization that it is more than just your certificate. That's right. What did you do? Hmm, that's a tough one. And I'll be very honest and plain with you. You know, for some of us, because of where we're coming from, we sort of had that, you know, pre premonition or that intuition that if we just concentrate on our academic credentials, we may not be able to amount to anything. Okay. And at a very early age, I got that understanding that, look, over several thousands of people will graduate probably with the same degree that I have, probably with the same qualification that I have. So there should be something unique that should set me apart. So honestly, whilst I was in school, I was into a lot of extracurricular activities because things like public speaking skills, you can't get it in the lecture room. Okay. You have to make a conscious effort to learn and to practice. Mm -hmm. You need to volunteer, put yourself out there, make the effort to look beyond just what your lecturers will teach you, go to seminars, be part of such engagement. For me, I discovered very early that that was an important thing that I needed to do in order to change my own prospects for the future. And a lot of young people don't have that perception. That's why I'm aggressively working to help them, together with people like you, help them to understand that, look, your destiny is in your hands. Because if you keep thinking that it's in the hands of your parents, in the hands of the elder, older generation and all that, you'll be very much disadvantaged because the older generation have their own things that they are dealing with. So I think that it is important for us to work together to help the young people understand that, look, the moment you can read and write, there's no excuse for you for failing to learn the things you're supposed to learn. Because if you continue to do the same things that our older generation did, we're going to get the same results. There'll be no difference. All right? So I think that that realization is important. And it, it will take more than lecturers to do that. So people like you and I, for the show you are running, for the engagements you do, that throws the light and the challenge to young people that, look, take your own destiny into your hand. Don't give it to any government. Don't give it to any leader. Don't give it to any politician. Take it into your own hands that you're going to do something with yourself. The moment you come to that realization, a lot of things change. A lot of things change. Right. I'm sure as we go on, we can share some yeah. examples. Uh, there is, I'm going to ask you a very controversial question. Sure. Uh, sure. It came up somewhere. Yes. Where people are of the view, young people are of the view that the very people who teach them at the universities, even at the lower level, yes. do not themselves have leadership qualities right. that they demonstrate to them. Right. Right. So by observing... They also have the feeling that when they carry on, it is the right behavior to put That's up. Right. Do you share in that view? To a certain extent, I do. And I think that, you see, it's all This about, is because yes. the argument is that they are not given the opportunity to express themselves, express their views That's right. on issues. That's right. So something is being taught, yes. and the young person has a contrary view. That's right. And in the bid to express that contrary <laughs> view, they are shut. That's it. Up. So, you see, I, I do a bit of human capital development. Okay. And recruitment is a very critical part of okay. getting the right people to do things. You know, here that too, the whole idea is that get your certifications and your degree, you qualify to be a lecturer in the university. Mm -hmm. But I think that going forward, if we need to change that paradigm, there needs to be a conscious effort to ensure that we're not just getting theory people or people with just academic credentials to teach our young people. Because I've been a teacher before. When I graduated from senior secondary school, I was a teacher. I did a national service as a teacher. And some of the students I've engaged with or I helped in those days always tell me that they are glad they met me. Why are they so happy about it? Because I was more than just looking at just the academic qualification. I was very tuned at finding ways of inculcating essential life skills into the engagement with them. That would give them the very big prospects or great prospects for the future. 
So if we need to change that paradigm, it has to start with the recruitment of our lecturers and our teachers in the various schools. And you and I will agree that some people go into teaching because it appears that there's nothing to be done. And the only way around is to go into teaching. So some of them are just there waiting for the end of month salary. And therefore, they are not even concerned about the people they are teaching. Look, something as basic as emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's a very important thing that a teacher needs to understand, Valid. appreciate, and utilize. Valid. But all of us are about two square times five is equal to four. That's and that's it. It, it ends the Valid. class. You're not even reading the nonverbal cues from your, your students to ascertain whether or not they are getting what you are trying to say or not. And that notion that if you're a teacher, you shut everybody up. Nobody talks contrary to what I'm saying. If you dare challenge me, you're a disobedient person. These things intimidate our young people to the point that now when they are into the world, there's that cloud of intimidation around them. And they are unable to take initiatives express and express themselves and do things that they're supposed to do. And that's the difference between an ordinary African child and then somebody that grew, grew up or grows up in the Western world. You realize that they are far more very confident Sexy. people, very articulate. They are asking their parents questions. Mommy, what happens when A and B come together? What is this? What is that? But in our local setting, maybe sometimes because of the stress and the poverty, we are just shutting our people down and keeping people from expressing themselves. And doc, it will surprise you beyond the classroom, even in organizations, even in business. Yeah, I was coming to yeah, that. CEOs don't give the opportunity for other people to express themselves. You are a national service person and you want to challenge me or you want to bring up an idea that is contrary to what I have in mind. And all those things, I think our cloud for respect and for accolades and for things like that, it's, it is rather damaging the system because people are not confident enough to express themselves. You know, so it goes even beyond the classroom. I know it starts from the classroom, but it goes beyond, beyond the, classroom. the classroom. So there's a lot of work we need to do, to do to be able to allow people to be themselves, to be able to articulate and express themselves, and to contribute to development. We cannot do it alone. We need all the people we work with and under us and above us and all of us to work together to get things done. Right. So that, that brings to mind, we have had discussions on this um, uh, leadership tricity about leadership and culture, That's right. leadership and... Uh, entitlement and That's all right. those That's things right. and uh, you are raising the same thing that yes. leaders within organizations must also look at the culture within the organization That's right. so that they must open up for right. younger leaders to be able to express themselves or young people to express themselves. That's right. I think that's a profound point that's and right. uh, needs to be highlighted. Now, let's go a bit into the corporate space. Yes. Now, in your intro, you mentioned that even when young people are given the opportunity, yeah. so let's bring it to the work environment, mm. sometimes they are intimidated, they are micromanaged. Yes. What can be done differently yes. to change that narrative? Great. So let me use an example to explain to you. You know, for some international organizations, they have a structured system to raise leaders. So the moment you get into the organization, there's a well thought through plan to help you grow and prepare you for leadership. If you compare it to most of our local organizations, Charlie, nobody cares about you. You have to work your way to the top. But in those structured organizations where there's a clear plan that in the next five years we're envisaging that you're going to be they have a succession top. plan. They have a succession plan, one. And then they start giving you opportunity at the very lower levels. So you work in a department, you are asked to work closely with the head of department. And the head of department is not fixated with his or her job the insecurity is missing because see, a lot of people are insecure about their jobs. So they are afraid that if you open up and you teach too much to the young people, they will come and take our place and they will have nowhere to play. And that level of insecurity is creating a lot of problems in raising the next generation of executives. All right? So I think that right from the onset, there has to be that concerted plan to ensure that young people are given the opportunity to learn. And remember that they are coming from the classroom with fresh ideas and fresh enthusiasm and all that. But they need to also be given the opportunity right from the grassroots to be able to grow and develop themselves. So, for example, if you're in a department and you're a head of department and there are people working with you, maybe national service or junior officers, certain times give them the opportunity to chair the meeting that happens in the office. You are there. You are present. You are supervising. You are watching them. Because they learn on practice, or we learn through practice. practice yeah. No matter how theory you put into a person, no, so much theory you put into a person, it is not the same as giving the person the opportunity to lead. And I think that because of the intimidation most of us suffer whilst growing up, we need to find leaders that can appoint, that can point out that Joseph or John or Mr. Abbey or Dr. Abbey, you are doing this tomorrow. Get ready for it. Because there are some people that will never take the initiative. They'll never volunteer. They'll never volunteer, but they are good. So you see, leadership is about also identifying potentials. 
So it will take a good leader to identify the, the potentials amongst the people they are working with, and then they can train, they can develop. There are certain high-profile meetings, certain times, take along some of the junior staff whom you've identified as serious, forward-looking, and you are envisaging that in the next few years, these are people that are going to help you make decisions. Take them along. Give them that opportunity. They may be observers at that point, but they are watching and they are learning. So I think that, look, in the corporate world, there has to be a conscious effort to raise leaders. I tell a lot of people that most organizations may not pay attention to that, but you need to take it into your own hand. You want to be a leader in the next five years. It's not just about your core competence. You need to understand some basic things, something as simple as customer service, something as simple as emotional intelligence, mm -hmm. something as important as communication skills, writing skills, report writing. You may not have been taught in the classroom, but because you see yourself as somebody that can rise to leadership, take it upon yourself to learn to build yourself because sometimes the opportunity may come at a time that you are not ready for but once you have been preparing the background the least opportunity you get that is your breakthrough for you and for some of us until we take that opportunity and prove beyond reasonable doubt that we are thorough we are well prepared we are capable and we can do it there will never be that opportunity for us to show what we can do that's quite loaded and i believe that a lot of us are learning we are picking from the experience and the knowledge being shared on leadership precisely that is our joy. Our joy is to bring guests who will continuously support us to, you know, demystify the, the leadership uh, thing. That it is something that all of us are capable of doing and backing on for the betterment of our communities. John, um, most of the things you said, I can link them up to the Sustainable Development Goals. That's all right. right. It is said that the young people. So let's take, for example, they have 17 development, uh, sustainable development goals. Yes. Uh, we take the first four that has to be no poverty, no hunger, good health and well being, and quality education. Yeah. It is believed that young people, looking at the statistics we have turned out or That's we right. have read from the yes. beginning, young people have the potential to make this thing a success, That's this right. sustainable goal, uh, development goal, a success. Do you share in that, in, that, in that regard? I do. I do. And I think that young people will need to realize that the Sustainable Development Goals is about us at the end of the day. You're talking about no poverty. You're talking about you know, equal opportunities and all that. It is about us. Sometimes people see it as very far from us, and we assume that it's a theoretical thing that we're talking about. But as long as young people are able to grasp the fact that this is about our future, because if we are working towards um, no hunger, we are working towards creating equal opportunity for people and uh, stuff like quality that, education. quality education and all that. We need to personalize it so that we can put ourselves in the place where we can contribute to the achievement of some of these things. And remember that the achievement of these goals will not be in a day or two. It will take a long while for some of these things to come to pass. If you look at the timelines the African Union has given and the UN and then all that, it tells you that there's a role that young people have to play in making this thing come to light. And so long as we see it as a part of us, okay, not like something in the classroom, not like something far away from us. It is about us. It's about the future we want to create and the future for our children that are yet to come. Then we can have that aggressive mindset that will push everybody into contributing to seeing this thing happen. Because unfortunately, some people think that it is for NGOs to champion some of these goals. Exactly. So people are laid back. They are not contributing. Matters of climate change doesn't, doesn't move them in any way. Oh, there are NGOs that are talking about it and doing all that. But we need to realize that it is all about us. If things don't go according to the plan, we will all be greatly affected. For the older generation, they may have some few years ahead of them, and they are gone. But we'll be left alone to face the, the impact of some of these things. So I think that we need to start drawing young people's attention to the fact that, look, the SDGs, it's not just isolated for uh, conferences and meetings and placards. They are practical things that we need to play our part to see them come to pass. So, for example, when we take um, no poverty and no hunger, Yes. It has to do with economic empowerment. That's right. How can young people contribute to that economic empowerment? Very good. So for me, the key things about practical things, very down-to-earth things that everybody can play a part of. If you don't work, you'll go hungry. So with that in mind, it empowers you to find something to do with yourself. Because no matter what, there may be abundance of food, but if you don't have the wherewithal to purchase or to buy or to have access to it, you will die of hunger, all right? So that's one. Number two, poverty. 
we have seen the impact that poverty has done. Sometimes I tell people that we don't need to watch TV to know the impact of poverty. Some of us grew up in the environment and we understand because of the lack of money to even buy something as common as paracetamol or a painkiller, a lot of people, you know, have, 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 have died. I work in a clinic. Sometimes you find people, a common disease like malaria that can be treated and taken care of. People will stay home and wait until it gets to the very serious point and they are now rushing to hospital. Even at the hospital level, people don't have the funds to pay. I know the health insurance is doing very well, but at the point in time, because of the lack of resources, people face health issues and health problems. So young people right from the onset need to understand that if they are to contribute to these things coming to pass, it is an individual decision you need to take. Hunger, poverty. We have seen the devastating impact and effect of some of these things. So right from your youthful stages, be thinking, what can I do on my own that can generate income for me? Okay. We're going to sure. talk about that in detail sure. when we come to entrepreneurship and Great. innovation Great. and all that. Great. So, uh, cherished viewers, we are having a conversation on the topic youth leadership and sustainable development. Let's take a quick break and we shall be right back. Welcome back, Ketsi Gold PLC, V5 Solutions Limited, and FB Global Consult. We are live on Metro TV, DSTV Channel 277, and on Facebook at Metro TV Ghana. This is the program Leadership 360. We are having a conversation around youth leadership and sustainable development, where so far our guest, Mr. John Apia, has taken us through some critical you know, discourse around the empowerment of the youth, the granting of opportunity for the youth to exhibit whatever they have, what they have studied, the knowledge they have acquired, and taking responsibility themselves to make an impact within the communities that they find themselves in for the betterment of our country and or countries and continents at large. John, yes, sir. Uh, before the break, we were talking about the taking responsibility, taking yes. some initiative, yes. that yes. dovetails into yes. entrepreneurship and innovation. That's right. Now, when you look at the space, it is also, statistics has also indicated that Africa is the, the, the hub for the next development phase of the world. That's right. And technology comes handy. That's right. Now, with young people, a generation from the millennials to the Gen Zs, what do you think, or what can the young people avail themselves, you know, to in terms of making a difference? That's right. Economic difference. Great. I think that for us as young people, technology is on our side. Matters of artificial intelligence, robotics, science, and then computer and technology. These are things that we need to harness to be able to make the best out of the situations that we find ourselves in. And I keep telling young people that, the application of technology is not limited to a certain category of businesses or a certain category of matters. In fact, everywhere and everything, technology applies. So I think that because we have that edge or that excitement around technology, we should look at how we can apply technology in our day-to-day -day activities to make life easier for us and also to solve some of the problems we have in our society. But if you are saying how we can use technology, do you think capacity exists among young people by way of technological know-how? The, the truth is that we may not have enough capacity to train and prepare young people with technology. But like I said, once you can read and write, once there's interest, there's a lot that young people can learn on their own. I know a particular organization, which is a non-governmental organization, that is consciously working at equipping young people with technological skills. Sometimes they do adverse calling for people to apply. And if you look at the numbers that apply, sometimes you are discouraged. But it tells you that there are a lot of opportunities beyond the conventional school training and the STEM training that maybe governments can champion. Yeah. 
there are a lot of organizations and institutions that are ready with their doors open to embrace as many young people as possible who are willing and ready to learn, to understand and know more about technology and how they can apply technology in their day-to-day -day activities. So again, it behooves on the young people themselves to look out for such opportunities like that. There's a lot you can learn on the internet. There's a lot that you can gain on the internet. Somebody will argue that, what about the practical skills? But like I'm saying, there are a lot of organizations as well that are open to help people get the practical part of the technology that they are reading about and learning about to be able to apply and use. And the future of work is moving to the point where technology becomes embedded in almost everything that we do. So for me, because young people are passionate about technology, most of the young people have very weird computers, sometimes phones, applications that you may even not understand. Mm -hmm. But it tells you that there's so much potential in the technology space that we need to harness and leverage on to be able to do something with ourselves. Look at something like football. Who would have ever thought that there could be application of technology to the point that if there's something that happens on the field, you can go back and watch it and then take a decision. Mm -hmm. It didn't used to happen, but it is a clear-cut application of technology. So it is not just for the science people and innovation and all that, but even for practical things that we do, there's a lot of ways we can weave technology into it to be able to make the best out of the situation, and that will help us a lot as young people. Okay. Now, before I came to the studio, yes, a bird whispered to me yes. that a lot of young people have the innovative, creative yes. with technology. Yes. Typical example, um, it, um, I think there's a school in uh, Ashanti region. Right. They have developed drones. They have done a whole lot. That's right. But such people are not supported. Mm. Even after school, that ends it. Most of them are not supported to move further with mm. developing these things to commercial uh, level so yeah. as to make a difference um, yeah. in economic difference in there. What, what do you say to that? I think that that one also, the, 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 the people involved have a lot more to do. Because you see, you need to be able to use technology to help you identify the gaps in the system. Yeah. So you have developed a drone. Sit down, ask yourself, in Ghana, as of now, which organizations are most likely to benefit from drone technology? For some, it may not even have come to their attention. But you look into the, the space, identify the gaps, put together your solution, and go to these organizations. You'll be surprised that that will open the door for you to be able to harness or use some of the things that you have done to be able to do something commercial that can bring you some revenue. But I think that the thought of just developing a concept and staying in your room and sit there, it's, it's, it's not okay. supposed so to happen. So it goes that beyond, it goes beyond that. that. You, you have need to be to go extremely aggressive okay. to be able to identify the gaps and where your solution comes in to break that gap. If you don't make that conscious effort and you're waiting for the businesses to identify you, they may not be able to identify you. Okay. So let me give you an example. A lot of us write theses and other things. Some do research based on organizations. And sometimes the organizations don't even know that you have come to do this research. And this level of knowledge you have can transform that organization. Mm -hmm. You get your first class and you graduate and you're happy and you're staying home. Meanwhile, the thesis you worked on is a practical opportunity for you to engage with that organization, perhaps even secure yourself a job because you've done your research, you have the facts and the figures, and you have a way to prove that if the organization goes in this particular tangent, it is going to help us. Okay. So I think that for us to just leave things as it, as, as it is, as it were, and hope that one day somebody will find you and bring you money, it will not happen. You have to be very conscious and deliberate about ensuring that the solutions you have produced is of benefit to the organizations and the businesses and the society. Yeah. Other than that, it will be in the museum, people will come and watch, and there's nothing that you can do out of it. All right. Yeah. Let's hold it there. Mm. Let's open the phone lines so our sure. viewers and audience can participate. The phone lines are now open. You reach us through 0531-982298 as displayed on the screen. 0531982298. If you are outside the shores of Ghana, just add plus 233 and you will reach us. You can equally send a WhatsApp and we will read it on the program as well. So we'll continue our discussion yeah. on the fact that the young people do not just have to use technology to develop something. They must go beyond the development exactly. to seeking support and marketing the, what it whatever it is that yes. they have done as well. Let me give you a practical yeah. example. There was somebody that developed um, a particular theory around something that was relevant to petroleum, a petroleum, uh, petroleum organizations. Okay. You know what the person did after writing it up or putting it up on Facebook and LinkedIn? 
it generated a lot of comments. And the person specifically tagged some of these petroleum organizations who eventually inboxed the person, asked or created that opportunity for the person to actually come to the office, sit down with the decision makers and talk about it. Okay, let's hold it there. <laughs> Francis Robert Shulman, good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, Doug. You're welcome to Leadership Prison Day. Thank you so much. Please go ahead with your point. Uh, it's good to always hear you guys. It's really helping out there. Thank you. Uh, so according to the other panelists, if you develop something innovative, the ways to get to the market and things like that. All right, so I spoke to you some time ago about a software that manages the affairs of the company, and most companies are using softwares in bit, HR, uh, accounting, and things, piece, piece. But we took the innovative to develop a software that has all these things in place. Now, we, are looking, we don't have the kind of finances to push it, so is it okay to align with maybe media houses to do butter trade? Uh, so we give them a percentage in it, or maybe 50, 80 percent, any of this. Is that also advisable? Well, thanks for the question. Uh, I will leave for <laughs> the guests to answer before I pass my comments. That's right. So, yes, the media plays a very important part in all of this conversation. Now, assuming that there's a show we are running that gives young people the opportunity to come and tell our audiences what it is they have done and what it is that they can do for organizations. Can you imagine the leverage they can get from the show? And with him saying that they are willing to even offload some of the shares to the media company that decides to do that, for me, it's a very innovative approach to getting things done. So there's a specific segment or a show that is created where young people can actually come and market and sell what it is that they have. And we as media people will have to do our work well by scrutinizing, asking the right question, pushing the frontiers to ensure that whatever goes out there, there are things that we are confident that is really going to make an impact. So there's always a way to engage with the traditional media. Again, social media exists for our own good. Maybe you may not get a space in the traditional media, but you can leverage on the power of social media, and there's so much more Thank you can sir. do. Okay. Mohamed from Tamale, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you, doctor? I, I am fine, thank you. As uh, usual, I, welcome I, to I, Leadership Yes, Institute. as usual. Today I'm also very happy that you are dealing with the youth. Okay. And the youth, the reason why I'm happy is that I'm, I, I'm a teacher. And then as a teacher, we know that your, 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 uh, your, your rest at an old age, or your or, or your enjoyment on your uh, on your uh, on your old age, depends on how useful you use your useful years to prepare for your future, uh, for, for 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 your use for your uh, age life. Why am I saying so? The useful stage is a dangerous stage. Because it's a dangerous stage because if you don't properly train the youth, then the future of the nation is also in danger. Because with the youthful age, that's where people, you know, at the youthful age, you are very, in, uh, you absorb things quickly. Mm -hmm. You can absorb technology very fast. Mm -hmm. And then if you, your absorption is a wrong absorption, then it will also be negative in your, in your old age. And you will realize that, like, like you are talking of technology, you have trained the people out. The people came out with their skills, but they cannot apply their skills. Or they apply the skill wrongly. I'm a carpenter. I learn how to uh, prepare doors, but survival is the first. <laughs> survival is the first. If I, I cannot get food to eat, definitely my skill in technology, uh, in my carpentry, will mean that I know how to break the door and I can easily become a thief. All right. And so, that is wrong, wrong technology. So that, that is why I'm saying that the youth currently, Ghana, we are in danger. Because well, in danger in the sense that 70%, if 70% of Africans are youth, and then 70%, and that larger percentage of those people are unemployed. 
are we not in danger? That is the reason. Thank you very much. That's the reason why um, we continuously roll out this program for all of us to share ideas for the betterment of our community. Your contribution, as usual, every week is very much, you know, cherished. And so we thank you again. The youth are the future of the continent, and we need to focus on them. Now, um, John, you yeah. were making a point that the, the younger people need to, you know, also appreciate the fact that they, they hold the key That's to it. their own future. You're right. Now, what will be your commentary or advice or suggestion to the older generation by way of intentional approach, be it policy or practical, you know, intentional approach to training and grooming the younger generation to take up the... You mentioned a few of them. Yes. But if you can. Yes. yes. I think that one, it's important. First, let me address the young people because sometimes yes. in our engagement with the older generation, we make it look like it's a competition with them okay. and that we are eager to move them out of the seat to go and take our seats. But we need to understand that it's a collaborative effort. It is not everything you may get in the classroom, but especially for those in the corporate and business world and even in the field of entrepreneurship, there's a lot we can learn from our entrepreneurs and our business leaders that have gone ahead of us. So that mindset will have to be correct. It's a collaborative approach right. to ensuring development. Two, the older generation also need to understand that there's no need to feel insecure about themselves because sometimes the fear and thought is that if you pass on all the knowledge and information to the young person you are training, the person will come and then approach you in court, and then the person takes over from you. And even if you notice apprentice and master's relationship, there are particular skills that the master will keep to his chest until death. Because the moment, and some young people too sometimes are over ambitious and over exuberant, and they are making it difficult for some of these older generation people to pass on knowledge to us. Because just a few keys you have access to, you are in charge. Okay, you hold it there. We have Samuel <laughs> on the line. Good afternoon, Samuel. Good afternoon, sir. Welcome to Leadership Tracy. Thank you. I'm privileged this afternoon. Please go ahead with your point. Okay. Oh, I'm calling to congratulate my brother. Uh, it's a long time I lost his contact, but today I'm privileged to see him delivering on Metro TV. My name is Samuel Apia. During our youthful days, they used to call me Kofi Eswai at Odessa, Mr. Pons Place. So, Kofi, God bless you for the good work. Your call has been. All right. Thank you very much, Samuel. Uh, leadership Christy, no matter where you are, once we identify you as a resource, we'll bring you on board. And everybody will smoke you out of your, <laughs> your, your hiding place to come and share knowledge yeah. with us. So, so I mean, one, one of my people growing up, and you know, okay. there's also the power of networking. You know, so we need to plug into networks. Now Sami has connected. Okay. I'll go back, find his number, and engage with him. I come from Kufuridia, all the state. Okay, so, just hold okay, it. Okay, sure. Bereza from Accra. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon, please. Please, you are uh, welcome, and uh, make your points, please. Okay, thank you very much. Hello, Ebenezer. All right, I guess we have lost uh, Ebenezer. Please yeah. go on with so, so the second point I was making was that the older generation will need to have that confidence that at the end of the day, whatever skill or knowledge that they will pass on to the younger generation, mm -hmm. we are not going to use that against them and therefore take them out of the system because they are thinking about also their security. Because in pension, in old age, when you can't do anything, you need the young people around you to continue support to support you. 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 Uh -huh. so, Time sure. is flying so <laughs> fast. Right. John, right. that's right. what happens right. on right. this show. And that's our right. Uh, cherished viewers always <laughs> wonder how time flies so slow. That's right. But, you know, there's one critical point that we have here. In all this, a very key denominator for all our discussions has to do with a quote that mm. we believe that when leaders subscribe, subscribe to, mm. it will pave way for greater things, the, the, the sustainable development of our community. So let's take a quick look at our Leadership 360 Honor Code, and when we are back, we will wrap up. Uh, program. I hope that you watch, share the link with your friends, with your colleagues. Let's spread the news so that all of us will learn, unlearn, and relearn to accelerate the development of our leadership skills for the betterment of our society as large.